But the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he, shall, he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word and for all that has transpired so far. And we ask, Lord, that we might have in our hearts what everyone else puts in the manger. Father, that is Jesus. That when we leave out of this place today, that there not be one person here who does not know Christ as their Savior, who has not made a place for him in their lives. And we thank you for that. And we ask that this morning's word would minister to us And we give you the praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. My message this morning is uh, I've entitled it Joseph, a man just like us. You know, I don't know. I have a hard time relating sometimes to Bible characters in a way. Some of them, I can relate to Peter because he screwed up. Amen. It's the just guys that I don't always get, you know, the ones who never messed up, who never had a bad day. I can, I can watch a TV show. You know, I can watch It's a Wonderful Life. I can relate to George Bailey. You know, I can get him. I understand that Mr. Potter is out there somewhere. Not in here, amen? We don't have any Mr. Potters in here, but uh, I, I, I can get that. But when I read about a guy like Joseph, I have a little harder time just getting my head wrapped around uh, what he had to go through. And if you think about it, it wasn't easy for Joseph. I mean, all of a sudden you find out that the woman you're getting ready to marry is with child, and you know it's not yours. That's not a good day. It's just not. It's just not going to be a good time for anybody when that happens. And and you're kind of like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? And and you're all freaked out, and you start having dreams with angels in them. Now, I don't know if he ever had any dreams with angels in him before, but he had a lot of them after this. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and he decides, okay, he's going to do the right thing, and he takes her, and, and the next thing he knows, man, the government's on his back. Taxes. See, they had a problem with taxes back then, too, amen? And they had this whole thing about your dad going to pay your taxes where you were born and not where you live, so he had to jump up and, and travel across the country with, a, with a, a pregnant wife, and I don't know if they rode horses and camels or what they had, if they walked. I don't know that it actually goes into that, but I can't imagine it was easy, amen? It wasn't like some of you had a hard time just getting to the hospital yourselves. You know what I'm talking about. And he gets over there, and they don't have any room for him where they're going to stay, and they end up having to stay in a manger, and it wasn't happy, and guests start showing up out of the everywhere. You know, he just wanted to get a good night's rest and sleep, and you're sleeping with cows and sheep and stuff anyway and the next thing you know you got all these shepherds running around and and then uh, later on you have these guys show up now they brought money you know the wise guys okay could have had a few more of those you know most of the people that show up my house on Christmas don't bring money you know what I'm saying man this wasn't easy and then as he's, as he's pondering all this, all this stuff's going on, he goes to dedicate his child at the temple, and, and man, everybody there's making a big fuss over him and talking all this fancy stuff about him. And, you know, even if you have angels speaking to you, the closer things get to reality, the more real it becomes, I, if that makes sense. I mean, it started to sink in, you know, a little bit. I mean, even when Jesus is 12 years old, he slips off. He gets away from his parents. They don't know where he's at. They're, they're like, really worried and concerned, just like you would be. Amen? And, uh, and then when they find him, he's like, hey, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Hallelujah. Joseph probably really took that to thought. Amen? The father's business. Huh. 
You know, when we look at Joseph, though, we can just see in this one passage some things about him that kind of tip us off to the kind of person that he was. And the first thing that we see is that he was betrothed. He was engaged to be married. You notice that in that when the angel spoke to him, the Lord spoke to him through the angel and said, take your wife. He didn't call it your fiance. Amen. Because in Jewish society, in that time period, the custom of being betrothed or being, uh, having a fiancé was just like being married. It was just like being married. I don't know. I was just getting in on somebody else's thing. <laughs> Hallelujah. That you, if you wasn't going to go ahead and marry them, you had to go through a divorce. Isn't that something? Ah, yeah, it wasn't going to be an easy thing. And we see that in the midst of all that, you know, he's thinking about this, and he's mindful not to put her away. He's going to put her away secretly. He's going to do something. He's going to figure out some way to get out of this, some way that's not going to make a public example of her. He didn't want her, I mean, back then, I mean, you know, adulteresses were stoned. You know, this wasn't a good thing. So he must have cared for her, amen? But this was, this was more than just some arranged marriage. I've heard people try to say, well, yeah, Joseph, you know, he was an old man. You know, he was 70 or 80 years old. Somebody texted me that the other day, and they said, yeah, Joseph was 70 or 80 years old. Wow. I said, wow, upside down is mom. <laughs> and I signed it, Jesus. <laughs> I don't know that Joseph was 70 or 80 years old. Some people like to teach that, that uh, Jesus was Mary's only son, uh, but I happened to catch that last verse, which says that Jesus was her firstborn Amen. There were others. Everybody likes to say, well, you know, all the, all the children that, that follow uh, Mary around, you know, James and the other ones, were all, uh, were all Josephs from another marriage. I don't think so. I think that they were, he was the firstborn. Amen. That's what it says. And he's also the firstborn in the family of God. Amen. You know, when you think about the betrothal, you and I are the bride of Christ. We're called the bride of Christ, but that hasn't actually been consummated yet, has it? Now, we are the bride in the sense that Christ has come and he's resided in our hearts. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, when we ask him to be our Lord, we are betrothed, amen? The Holy Spirit, as a sign of the promise, is given to us, and we are saved. But then again, we haven't went to the marriage supper of the Lamb yet. I mean, there's parts that haven't taken place. We, as the bride of Christ, have our role here. You know, some people say, well, you know, uh, some people don't believe that you can backslide and go to hell. Some believe that you can backslide and go to hell for anything. I mean, you know what I mean? There's extremes on it. I'd like to think it's closer to the you can't hardly get out of it. If being betrothed meant that they had to go through a divorce, I would think that we're probably going to have to do something pretty serious to get out of going to heaven if we've asked Jesus to be our Savior. Amen? I don't believe we can do anything. I believe we can turn our back on God. I believe that we can backslide. I believe the Scriptures tell us that we're supposed to try to help those who have backslid and get them, even when they're as close to the fire of hell and they have smoke on their clothes, we're supposed to grab them and bring them back. But I don't think it's an easy thing. I don't think every time I mess up, God's writing me off his Christmas list. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I think I've got a place in heaven. And even though I may not deserve it, the truth is I never did. Jesus died for me because I was a sinner just like everybody in this room. And most everybody in this room has received him as their Savior and has repented. And if you haven't, you'll have an opportunity to do that today. So why live another day without knowing for a fact that you're going to heaven? Amen? Why live another day? Well, you know, I've got to get right. I've got to be completely pure. Well, that's not exactly true. Because he loves us while we were still yet sinners. He died and gave himself for us. Amen? He wants us to come to him. And that's what it is. That's what it's all about. So we know that he was betrothed. He was in a relationship. You and I should be in a relationship. We are the bride of Christ. The second thing is he was just. Now, just in the Old Testament, let me, let me read a definition for you. It meant upright, blameless, righteous, conforming to God's laws and man's. And originally used to describe people who lived in accordance with the rule or customs. Joseph did what he could 
to live right. Now, Joseph had a disadvantage that you and I don't have. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't know Christ as his Savior. I mean, Christ hadn't even been born yet, you know, when this uh, story starts out. So he didn't know Jesus as his Savior, which is kind of a funky thing when you think about it because, you know, his son, you know, his stepson, if you want to put it that way, uh, is, going to be, is going to be the Lord and Savior of all the world. That's just, that's mind-blowing. And I, and I understand why some people have a hard time getting their heads wrapped around Jesus in the first place. They have a hard time thinking, wow, you mean he died for all of us? He came and was born for the purpose to die? Yes, that's what the Scriptures teach us. But when we receive Christ as our Savior, we have Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph didn't have that, but he still tried to live according to the law. And there's a lot of people who try to be good and try to live according to rules and precepts and commands and, and try to work their way to heaven. They knock on doors and ride bicycles and do all kinds of things to try to get to heaven. Amen? It doesn't get you there. Amen? You have to have Christ as your Savior. You have to have Jesus in your heart. The Bible tells us that we basically are justified by faith. Amen? Hallelujah. I've got some scriptures I think I didn't. Yes, in Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to work for salvation. It's, it's free. Amen? It's by grace through faith. In fact, in our next scripture... For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hallelujah. See, we do have a Christmas gift. It's the gift of salvation. It's a gift that you just have to receive. Now, when people come to bring me presents, you know, I don't usually just go, well, no, thank you. I can't take that. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I didn't get you anything, you know. I, uh, I usually go, well, thank you very much, kindly. Hallelujah. Now, if I heard something in there rattling like a rattlesnake, I might be a little concerned. Amen. I might have Cheryl open it for me. But, <laughs> hallelujah. But the fact is, we want to receive the free gift. Amen. You can't earn that gift. It's free. Sometimes I wasn't the uh, shining star that I should have been when I was a young person. Amen. My parents still gave me Christmas presents. Amen. Sometimes they gave me the belt, but that was... <laughs> Hallelujah. You've been there. Hallelujah. Amen. But the fact is, God wants to give you something, eternal life with him. You see, the unfortunate thing is, is that everybody here is going to live for eternity. Amen? We are, we are eternal beings. The question is where we're going to make our abode. I want to make the right choice about it. Amen? The third thing that I see to hit about him was that he was open to God. In verse number 20, it says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. An angel appeared to him and began to minister to him. You find in chapter 2, in verse number 13, it says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And then in verse number 19, it says, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And then verse number 22, I think it is. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. You know, what I see about this is that Joseph was open to the supernatural. Amen. He was open to God doing something. A lot of times people, their, their problem with Jesus and with Christianity is that it requires a belief in something that's only proven with our hearts. Now, I've, I've read some really good things that uh, explain the, the, the change in the disciples after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and things that happened that would be really good apologetics, we call it, that prove to me that Jesus, you know, I hear some, but to absolutely get right down to it, it is 
justification by faith. Amen? You, you just have to believe it. It isn't, it isn't going to all figure out. You're not going to be able to get the theorems and everything coming together. However, a lot of people who are in science actually uh, can prove a lot if we would actually listen to them. But so many people are taught something else. I'm thankful that even though my family wasn't in church a lot when I was a kid, they still taught me some right things and that I knew who Jesus was. I lived in a different time period than we live in now. Amen? People don't hear it at school anymore. Public discourse isn't about the things of God as much as it used to be. If you're lucky, you live in a small town, and they still have articles written by pastors like we have. Amen? But in a lot of places, they don't have that anymore. You know, a lot of higher places of uh, learning started out as Bible colleges. If I'm not mistaken, I believe one of our, our, our Chi Alpha guys came one time, and he said on IU, if you look, their symbol is like a book. It used to be the Holy Bible. But now it's just a book. And unfortunately, that's the case with a lot of things in society. What used to be holy and what used to be good is now about greed. It's about self. Amen. And everybody wants to live the way that they want to live. Hallelujah. Thankfully, we have a Savior that can bring us out of all that. We don't need Rudolph to guide our sleigh at night. Hallelujah. We've got a Savior that can take us where we need to go. Praise God. We are the bride of Christ. And you know, you can, be, you can be born again and still not be open to what God's saying to you. Amen? You still might not be open to the supernatural. There's hundreds of thousands and millions of believers out there who don't really believe in supernatural things. When they do studies, when they check on things, there's a lot of Christians who don't even believe in heaven. Or they don't believe in hell. Even more of them don't believe in hell. They don't believe God. If he's such a good God, how could he send anybody to hell? Well, he doesn't send anybody to hell. Because they don't receive Christ into their hearts. They go there themselves. Amen. He didn't kill all those babies in Bethlehem. That was Herod. You and I have to make conscious choices based on our faith. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we have to respond to that. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We have to call on the name of the Lord. Amen. We've got to respond to God as he's trying to give us this free gift. Last thing that I see here is that he did what was asked of him. In verse number 24, it says, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. We've got to respond correctly. You know, sometimes I can be born again. I can be justified by faith. I can feel like I'm being open to God. I'm willing to listen. But do I follow through? Do I do what's required? You know, every so often I'll meet someone, if they're an older person, I like to look at it this way, and they, they talk about, well, you know, I'm just not ready. And I say, well, you know you need to get saved. Yeah, I know. You know Jesus Christ is your Lord. You, you know that he's, he died on the cross for you, right? Yeah, I know, I know, but, but I'm just not ready. You know where They're just one decision away from salvation. They already believe they just haven't made confession of faith. They're just afraid to step forward. I like to talk to the older ones, and I say, look at this. If life went from your elbow to the tip of your finger, and that's how, life, how long life was, where are you at right now? Up in here somewhere? I mean, they're getting along in years. They're about to go, when are you going to grab a hold of salvation? You haven't got that much more time. We've got to impress upon people their responsibility. See, we don't have to get ourselves saved, but we have to respond to salvation. Amen? Even as Joseph responded to what the angels were saying, he took to him his wife. We've got to respond to what God's saying to us. We've got to respond to him. We've got to come to him as someone who needs him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Another example why I don't lead worship, but... (laughs) 
God can put a song in your heart this morning. Amen. God can minister to you. Can I have Tiffany or someone come back to the keyboard and play for us, Kayla? Whoever might be close. Thank you, Lord. You know, as I was thinking about Joseph, I, uh, I realized that down the road after Jesus is 12, we don't hear anything else about him. And there's a reason for that. At least I think there is. It, the story is not about Joseph. It's about Jesus. The good news, the gospel, is about Jesus Christ. It's not about Joseph. The story is not about you and I. Amen. When they write the second book of Acts, and they've got all the things that we've done in it, some of us won't even be mentioned. Some of us will barely be mentioned. Maybe some of us will have a whole chapter. Wouldn't that be nice? Amen. Billy Graham's got some spots in there, I bet. And we know some others that do. But the question is, will we be listed at all? You know, when you go to the list in the book of the names where the, the, the people who's uh, been saved is, the book of life, and you see all the names, that's where it's at. That's the book we want our name in, amen? I, I don't care whether I get in the second book of Acts. I hope I do some stuff. I praise God, you know, and, and give him glory for anything that I do. But where I want my name is in the Lamb's book of life. I think most of us can agree with that. I want to ask you to do something today. I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet. It may be that you're here this morning and you've never responded to the Christmas story. I mean the real story, the story of the Savior that was born for you. Maybe you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord. Now I know that a lot of people here have because you've been in church and I know that because you've been here. Others of you, I know you have because I know who you are, even though you may be a guest this morning. But you never know whether a person's really asked Jesus into their heart. You never know. I don't know. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you've done. I know this. You have a Savior that died for you on the cross. And this morning, if you would respond to Him, He'd wash away your sins and make it whiter than snow. He would cleanse you today. You can say, well, I don't know if I'm ready. Why? Why put it off? Amen? Why not respond this morning? Why not give Jesus the opportunity to change your heart? We all know the Grinch, amen? His heart was changed. That's the good part of the story. We uh, can have a changed heart today. If we will receive Christ as our Savior, I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, I want you to just think about it carefully because there's no reason to put it off. There's no reason to wait another day. Today is the day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. We need to make conscious choices now. He's, even, as Jesus, even as Joseph was open to the God, we need to be open to God. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord, but you know you need to, you want to this morning, I want you to reach your hand up, stretch it up as high as you can so I can see it. See that hand? Are there any others? If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never asked Him into your life, and you know that today's your day. Stretch up your hand. Let me see it. Maybe you're here this morning and you can say, Well, Pastor, I've asked Jesus into my life. But unlike Joseph, I've never really done what he's told me. I've never followed him. I've lived my own life. I've done my own things. I've just not been faithful to the things of God. I've not tried to be a Christian that I ought to be. I'm just kind of doing it 
once in a while or not at all. If that's you and you want to rededicate, if you want to reinitiate your relationship, if you want to get back on the good list, so to speak, I want you to raise up your hand. I want you to lift your hand up now if you know that you could be doing better than what you have been with God's grace. Yes. Yes, I see those hands. Yes. Yes, I see those hands. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to pray for you right now. And the one that raised his hand for salvation, I'll talk to in a minute. But I want to pray for all of us. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your grace, your mercy, your peace. I thank you that this morning you can touch every heart here, especially those who know that they need to respond to you more. They need to listen to you more. They need to follow what you're saying to them more. I pray for them, Father, that everything that's in their way be removed, that you make their way straight, that they can follow after you, that they would not only have ears to hear, but, Lord, you would give them the grace to answer the call, to fulfill what it is you called them to do, to do whatever it is you're speaking to them. And I thank you for that this morning. May the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with them. And I thank you, Father, for all the people who are in this room. And I pray for all their family, their loved ones, all the people who aren't here that's part of this body. And I thank you that today you would minister to them wherever they're at. We thank you, Lord, that the Christ child that was born would be ever present in our hearts that we would be ever mindful of the fact that Lord we could celebrate the birth of our Savior every day and not just at Christmas and I thank you and I praise you for it and I pray also Lord especially for all these little ones that we have what a blessing what a testimony it is to parents who are trying to serve you and I thank you that you protect them and watch out over them every day of their lives. That they always have a testimony of Christ. That the parents who are here would be mindful of the fact that they have a responsibility to see to it that their children are not just in plays, but that their children are in you, serving you. And I thank you for it, Father. Help us, Lord, to raise our children correctly. And Lord, we give you the glory today. We thank you for being with us. May the Spirit of Christmas be the spirit that rules and reigns in our lives and we give you the praise in the name of Jesus amen